my friend. Good to be here, Michael. How's well, things in your part of the world? You. Well, so far, so good. Um, you know, it's hot one day and cold the next, but I think a lot of the country is experiencing that, huh? Hey, and sinkholes and flooding and earthquakes and volcanoes elsewhere, <laughs> yes. Hey, yeah, did you see absolutely. That one, did you see that one about the golfer that the sinkhole opened underneath him, swallowed him up? Yes, and how about yeah, we the got guy that on the Florida. website? Yeah, yeah, I was telling Holly she put it up, and I had a look at that, and I thought, gee whiz, you know, that's that's kind of neat we could say, instead of making a hole in one, it was one in a hole. <laughs> oh, that's bad. It's funny, but it's bad. I mean, could oh, you imagine? Oh, I know, I know. You're standing there getting ready to, uh, you know, hit the ball down the down the grass, and all of a sudden the earth opens up. And there's a lot of this going on now. Oh, I know, I know. All over the place. So, China yeah, is abs- well here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Louisiana um, is a big, big sinkhole there, too. Uh, so what's going on, Stan? I mean, uh, you you seem to have a pretty good handle on a lot of this stuff and uh, with the increase in earthquakes and so on. I guess we could start there if, if you want um, with the earthquakes. Uh, you do pretty good at, I don't want to call it predicting, but, you know, it's predicting where the next big ones might show up. How do you do it? Well, um, I developed a technique that uh, I, oh gosh, I I guess it was 1995 when I started uh, playing with some data from the U.S. Navy. And at the time, uh, the Navy at, at California at Monterey were putting up twice a day maps of the oceans of the world with the data they were collecting from their submarines and from buoys and ships and from some satellites. Now, the data they put up was showing the uh, sea surface temperature all over the planet. It also showed the deviation from the normal of the sea surface temperatures all over the planet. Now, if you look at, you know, temperatures of, of the sea, normally there's this big red swath of hotter at the equator and cooler toward the polar regions, you know, big deal. But I looked at their, what's called their anomaly map, the difference in today's uh, sea surface temperature as compared to, say, an average of 30 days or a year before. They use different averages, but still, it shows you how unusual the ocean temperature is in certain places, everywhere, actually, according to the average temperature. Well, it made pretty pictures. It had little, you know, globs of color here and globs of color there and, you know, and blues and reds, and I thought, well, this is interesting. And I was playing around with it one day, and I had a couple of days maps of this uh, sea surface temperature in front of me, and I was using Photoshop, and I put the two images together, and I subtracted them, I added them, I multiplied them, and see if it made neat patterns, just, you know, killing time. And, well, gosh, that was interesting. I thought I I looked at around the California coastline there, and in the images that I was playing with, the day before I'd seen some kind of a, like a, on their maps, it was yellow and green, a yellow and green thing like a butterfly right on the coast of the United States there where an earthquake had happened the day I was looking at it. I thought, well, I wonder, I mean, I don't know why, but maybe there's a change in sea surface temperature or something, and, you know, um, that'll be a precursor for earthquakes. Well, I started developing the technique, and uh, it took me a while to work out the kinks in it, but I also found out that the Navy not only was taking data from you know, temperature changes, but they were accidentally or otherwise putting in electrical field data from their satellites showing changes in electricity in the atmosphere above, you know, fault lines. Not that they intended to do it, just I think it was just a byproduct of the way they did the maps. Well, okay, so I figured out that, uh, make a long story a little bit shorter, that the change in temperature on one side of a fault line versus the one on the other side of the fault line, you know, the the temperatures on either side of the fault line, when those became uh, at opposites, like one got colder, one got hotter on that map, that it formed kind of like a little rough butterfly wing, left wing being yellow, right wing being green, and it was, you know, one pressure, one temperature and charge going up and the other one going down. And electricity was taking the, the heat from one side of the fault line up in through the air just above the sea surface and going into the other side of the fault line and delivering heat to that side. So one side was getting cold, the other side was getting warm. 
this is something that happens in uh, you know electrical theory. You know, Thompson effect and Peltier effect. They, they, the electricity actually sucks heat out of one side of the conductor and puts it over to the other one, uh, especially in dissimilar joints. Now, around around the coastal areas, the coastlines of all the continents, there are you know huge formations of crystallized rock from ages ago. And when you fracture some of these with the pressure, you start to press on them to, to break them apart. It's like taking one of those wintergreen um, lifesavers in the dark and hit it with a hammer. You see flashes of light from the electricity produced by breaking the crystals in the wintergreen you know, lifesaver. This is the same thing that happens called piezoelectricity. And, uh, piezoelectricity. And when these fault lines get under pressure and about to erupt, it might take one to ten days sometimes before the eruption or the earthquake finally takes place. And, of course, the bigger it is, I found out, the earlier we get a signal because it starts to build, 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 build like that over two or three days, and I say, well, something's going to happen there. And that's basically uh, the concept I used up until 2006 when the Navy stopped supplying the maps, or at least to the public. They got new satellites and new programs and discontinued it. Now, I did visit the Navy with Holly at, at Monterey early in the game, and they told me I would have about a 30% error in my calculations because they had about a 30% error in theirs from cloud cover and you know faulty buoys and submarine data that was missed and that kind of stuff. Therefore, they said we can't endorse you publicly because of this heat. Uh, sorry, because of this error in, in the heat maps. But we will look at your site every day. Interesting theory. Now, when they stopped producing the maps that I was using, about a year or so later, I was reading a technical paper and found out that the U.S. Navy, among other scientific groups, had suddenly decided to start looking at the electrical methods of forecasting earthquakes by studying the electric components over the fault line, exactly what I've been doing for, you know, 10 or 11 years before that. It was flattering in that respect, and uh, I guess about a year before I lost their data, uh, I was contacted by the the entire admiralty in a, in a uh, phone call, a conference phone call, the entire admiralty of Mexico. And they wanted to know how to do these maps because they wanted to be able to predict, you know, tsunamis and earthquakes along the western uh, Mexican coast, which I explained to them and, and uh, told them where to get the information from the Navy and whatever. Uh, and also had a, a phone call uh, from the Association of the 50 Island Nation States around the world because they really have to worry about tsunamis and sea level rise and things like that. And these people were all using the service, and then, of course, we lost the data. And it wasn't until this year that I figured out how to get data from other types of uh, data streams that weren't uh, you know, classified or weren't Navy and that kind of stuff, put them together. It takes a little bit longer, about three times as long, but I put them together and was able to then forecast earthquakes this time. The data is so accurate, I was absolutely stunned. I hit 90% of the earthquakes that do occur with this, amazing. and that's how I do it. That's amazing. Now, what about inland? Is there a way uh, to do this inland, or does this only work um, on the coast? Um, I can't do it. I need a bigger, com I mean a big computer to do that, mm -hmm. and access to the the uh, infrared high-detail uh and these are classified, but over land masses, the, the heat signature of the land. You have to have a supercomputer or, or one that's really pretty powerful to separate the heat signatures and changes, you know, heat and cold, of mankind's activities on the, the land mass from those that are, are geo-produced uh, temperature differentials and uh, charge differentials. I'm sure we could do it. The same thing applies. But, um, you know, I suppose if we could get the government to put sensors, you know, charge sensors along known fault lines, major fault lines like New Madrid and stuff, that we could get the the warning ahead by by doing that. And, and they may be doing that now. Okay, there there are a lot of sensors around the New Madrid area. I see them on the maps here. A lot of sensors that may also be measuring the electric component, which you know does give us a sneaky clue that something's about to happen. I can't do it, but the government can. Is this kind of like, now I've heard uh, with big earthquakes like what Japan had with Fukushima, um, people reported seeing like, I don't know, circles in the sky. Uh, I don't know if they were cloud circles or energy circles of some sort. Is that what, would that cause something like that? Um, 
I hadn't heard circles before. I've heard uh, balls of light popping up out of the ground. Uh, that's okay, happening. maybe that's what it was. Yeah, uh, the, and I think that's what we would normally call ball lightning or ionized uh, gas bubbles. And these are likely to occur where you have this tremendous pressure under sea there or along the coastline producing uh, electric charge, which is released, but sometimes it can be released in in a manner that's similar to when severe lightning strikes and it can't find a, a place to unload all of its charge in that lightning bolt. And it, it hits like a roadblock on the earth and bang, it bounces up and forms a spinning sphere of charged particles. I think it's something similar to that that's caused by the mechanical action as well as the electric action of a fault line. There are definitely I changes see. that occur in the sky, and, you know, and and in animal behavior just before a major quake. There's no question about that. Yeah, I always tell people uh, if you see the animals acting funny, then uh, you know something. There's your sensors right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, well. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. What are what are some of the key fault lines of concern right now? I mean, do you, do you expect any major activity uh, in any of them anytime soon? Um, yes. The um, every day Holly puts up the maps after I figure them out on, on the website. Currently, uh, in the last month, when I say current, the last month, a little bit over a month, probably six weeks. I've been seeing a lot of Richter 5 plus, you know, up into the sevens earthquakes on the left side of the ring of fire in the Pacific. And that's the fault line that runs from Kamchatka Island in Russia down through Japan and down into the Philippines and down to New Guinea and over into New Zealand through a zigzag kind of path. That's the left side of the ring of fire around the Pacific. Now, there's been like four to one, four times as many of these larger earthquakes occurring there than normal when compared to the major earthquakes over in the west coast of South America and the United States and Central America. Some of these quakes on the west side that have been increasing in number and magnitude drifted all the way around into uh, the uh, islands of uh, Indonesia on the west side, um, close to what are we looking at? Sumatra and uh, Singapore. I'm just looking at my map here, mm-hmm. where we've had again an increase of these larger quakes. And there, by the way, I'll get back to this in a minute. But there's something happening in the North Indian Ocean has been for the last uh, eight days, which is really, really unusual. We'll get to that in a second. Now, okay. back over on the eastern side of the Pacific Ring of Fire, we're now starting to see pressure zones build up for earthquakes and volcanoes. They both get the same kind of signature. More than we have ever seen or I've ever seen before in the, the some, what, uh, 17 years that I've been doing this. There are three, I guess four actual zones from um, the southern part of Mexico all the way down to um, Ecuador. And on their coastlines, we're getting consistent thermal and electrical anomalies there that do not go away. Normally these would happen, and about a, a day to four days later you get an earthquake, you know, big deal, okay, it was an earthquake there. But these are hanging on, and this is not good. Now, I did read recently that there is a considerable opinion saying that there's going to be a new plate breaking loose, a tectonic plate in northwest Africa there, in that area where I'm seeing all this activity, and that might be the reason we're seeing these thermal electrical signals is that plate is about to fracture. Now, if you go up the coastline from there to the Baja and up near the Salton Sea in Southern California and up into uh, Oregon and into Washington State where they have the Juan de Fuca plate, that area is also starting to see some activity, but not enough to panic yet. And the, the Baja thing down in California, not enough to panic yet. I am expecting to see, uh, to, to balance things, I'm, I'm expecting to see an increase in larger earthquakes, Richter 5s and above, on the west coast of the United States from Washington State all the way down to the Baja, and then also in Central America, Mexico, and northwest uh, side of South America, plus down into Chile and Peru. But when these come up, I report them with circles, and if they're something really to warn people about, I put alert and point to it and explain and say, you know, we've got a problem here. Let's keep an eye on it and get your earthquake or volcano preps in order. Now, the anomaly I was talking about over in the North Indian Ocean 
is something that I can guess at the cause, but I'm not sure. For the last seven to eight days, now it's been building, it's five zones of extreme heat. Now this is just thermal, this is not electrical. Extreme heat in these five zones. It's three right across at the equator and then two up on either side of the uh, uh, country of India. Now, I've never seen this before ever, and it just hangs on and hangs on. I've had Holly put those up on the website uh, in the, the page that we use, uh, uh, the front page of the news page, or you'll see it in today's news down about, well, it's probably the second big picture there on the left side. And there are two links, one to the animations of the day's changes and then the net effect in the Indian Ocean. Now, I think what is happening is that because the Earth is expanding, and I think this is causing a lot of sinkholes as well, it is stretching the surface of the Earth, and there's a hot magma flow, or maybe five plumes of hot magma underneath the mantle, pushing up to try to you know, break through in the North Indian Ocean. Now, this happened, something like this happened eons ago, in, in biblical terms, before the time, or around the time of Peleg, the meaning the dividing of the continents. When the Earth broke, when the continents broke, rather, and were spread apart as the Earth expanded to, you know, um, where we are now, which is about 25% larger than it used to be before the time of the continental breakup. So there was something then that pressed on this area to force Africa to separate from Australia and Indonesia and all that to spread apart. You can see it in the, the mud maps or the bathymetry maps of the Indian Ocean where it really stretched the surface hard there. This may be occurring again, and I have no idea why it picks on that spot on the planet, but it is a heat signature primarily, a totally, you know, a heat anomaly that I've never seen before. And So I'm telling people over there, you know, uh, kind of pay attention. You might have a problem. Those are yeah, the that's now. fascinating. Now, now if that call, happens, I'm go sorry, on, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. If that happens, what? Well, I say if that happens, that will affect more than just that area of the planet, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We're, <laughs> we're not isolated from that. No, no. I, in fact, I've, I've, um, I've thought about that, and uh, it's what's that, about 182.70... Let me just do a calculation. I'm trying to see how far away that is from the other side of the planet in the Atlantic. Uh, okay, that's two and a half there. Yeah, hmm. Well, that's interesting. That is interesting. If that's inside the planet, something pushing up and causing heat to rise up in the North Indian Ocean and at the equator, then if you go over to the uh, other side of the planet at the equator to see what's in the, the antipodal or opposite position of these heat signatures, you'll see that it lands you up in the uh, 90 degree west uh, latitude, uh, longitude, yes, about the same. It It's strange enough exactly where the plate is breaking in Mexico, Central America, and uh, Ecuador, you know, and, and in essence on the northwest side of South America. The heat signatures are underneath that on the other side of the planet. So is this meaning that the pressure of the plate breakup over there is causing the temperature rise in the Indian Ocean or vice versa? I don't know. But those two, I've, I've just now discovered it. Look at the map I'm talking to you. Those are exactly opposite of each other on the planet. That's weird. That's amazing. Yeah, that is strange. Uh, so what do you think we're seeing here? What does this all mean? I mean, what is causing the planet to get so active all of a sudden? Well, it's a thing that I think is a natural progression in the, in the aging of planets and moons and stars and galaxies. As they age, they dissipate energy in their spin, which gives them gravity, and they they expand. The, every planet in the solar system that I've been able to check with NASA photos shows signs of at least 20% expansion or more in the diameter of the planet since it was had a solid surface, except for the gas giants. You can't tell there, but there are moons you can tell. So as, it's like a ballerina doing a pirouette, and she's got her arms in tight. She's spinning fast. She yawns, I'm getting tired of this. And she stretches her arms out. As she does, she slows down. And basically that's an analogy that I would apply to the situation. That's why the Earth is about to go through another expansion stage. It's time. Now, the sun does that too. and We might be seeing something interesting there now. 
Yeah, that was my next question, uh, is the sun. Uh, what's going on with our sun? And, uh, you know, a lot of people are wondering if they should be concerned about what's going on. All right. Before I just answer that question on the sun, I forgot you asked me about, uh, you know, earthquake zones I was looking at. Another is the New Madrid. Now, it's harder to detect changes that are going to affect the New Madrid for me because there's not water up close to the northern side of it. But it follows the Mississippi River bed down, and a branch of it goes off through Arkansas. So what I do look at is the Gulf of Mexico along the Louisiana coast for signatures of seismic activity there. And last week there was one, I think, I'm not sure that I caught it. It was such a small signature, but an earthquake did occur there. Now, with the sinkholes occurring in Louisiana, and, and they will continue to occur offshore as well because there are a lot of those salt domes off in the Gulf of Mexico along the Louisiana coast and going eastward toward Florida. As it does, these things are going to stretch and break and fall in on themselves natural progression even without our help but that might be a trigger that releases pressure along the the new major fault line going up toward the great lakes and it might uh, contribute to it uh, having an earthquake you know richter eight or better that's okay that's earthquakes now back to your sun problems um the it's a strange thing because nasa has been saying and is still saying that this 24th sunspot cycle on the sun is the grand solar maximum right now. And they've said this is the biggest solar maximum since they started keeping records in the late 1500s. Well, no, not they, but astronomers. And unfortunately, they they say this, but when you look at the number of sunspots that are occurring right now, it's supposed to be the peak, it's below average. It's not even high. Yet, although the sunspots are not heavy, the number of of um, coronal holes, they call them, they're black uh, areas on the sun. When you look underneath the chromosphere where we see all the light and stuff and the sunspot, you dig down deep in that with some of the uh, other types of frequencies they monitor from the sun, and you'll see there are more of these holes forming underneath, big holes. I mean, like, you know, a sixth of the the uh, the sun that you can see on one side going, you know, having these dark coronal holes, and maybe, maybe even a third at some times. And from these, we're seeing uh, strange magnetic anomalies spinning uh, you know, funnels and vortices of magnetic fields and hot plasma gas and erupting and throwing out coronal mass ejections. And we're seeing more of those at the moment, have been for some time, in this supposedly the maximum of this sunspot cycle. Now then, uh, the solar physicists are saying, well, hmm, it's not a maximum, but maybe, um, well, it's dipping down a bit. It'll dip down a bit later this year, but then it'll punch back up and make a second maximum in 2014. And so it'll be a double hump, you know, a double uh, sunspot uh, peak for this cycle, which is uh, fairly rare. Mm-hmm. Now, what is also unknown by a lot of people in the public, because they don't pay attention to this in detail, is that right now the sun itself, is in the process of flipping its north and south pole, reversing them. Now, it does this every 11 years, and so every 22 years, things are back to normal. But because the Earth's magnetic field is weakening, and no secret there, it is now a little bit flimsy in its you know north-south alignment strength. Suppose that we get a huge coronal mass ejection next year or two from the sun. It's, it's charged, it's protons coming at us. And there's a magnetic, like, Catherine wheel effect coming out from the sun and the solar wind. It hits our planet constantly with varying densities and speeds. Now, if it starts to flip its pole, it's going to affect the solar wind polarity, which will then try to flip upside down our own magnetic field in our in our planet. So we have to oh, watch that. Yeah. The, the, the drifting in the North Pole is twice as fast as the South Pole at the moment, in the magnetic pole. And if that does occur... During the transition, our magnetic field will be even weaker. And there will be, uh, if it it starts to wobble, even not flip, but starts to wobble, it's going to weaken our uh, shield from solar and uh, stellar radiation that protects us, especially from ultraviolet. Because our shield is our ionosphere and our Van Allen belts, and these things help to deflect all these heavy radiations. If we lose that or weaken it down to a point that it's ineffective, it's like being in Starship Enterprise 
and you yell for shields, and there ain't none, Captain. The incoming <laughs> radiation will hit hot spots all over the planet, and that ultraviolet radiation, I've experienced it, uh, you know, a small to a small degree. When the ozone layer had a hole in it over Perth, Australia, when I was there, and it hurts. It makes your eyes weep just looking outside, even sunglasses. It hurts going through your clothes like pen pricks sticking your skin through your solid clothes. Now that wow. was a minor effect of it. I've seen uh, and talked to people. It was happening in in an island off the north coast of South America there, and it was when the South Atlantic anomaly, which is a, a hole in our magnetic field. When it broadened and the very edge, you know, the very weak edge of it drifted that time for about two or three days up over these islands there. And when it did, we started getting calls from people saying, look, uh, this is something to do with the sun. You know, um, our our children are are getting headaches and uh, nausea and rashes on their skin and they can't be outside in the sun. It hurts. And adults, same thing is happening to them. And people, you know, the doctors at the hospitals were having case after case and they couldn't figure out what was causing it. Well, it was a type of radiation sickness from the increased ultraviolet that had gotten through that hole when it weakened just momentarily in Earth time. So, so if the magnetic pole should flip, then we've got a lot more to worry about than just refrigerator magnets falling off the fridge, huh? Yeah, a lot more <laughs> than that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing this is developing now because uh, in the biblical prophecies in the book of Revelation, it does speak about the light of the moon will be seven times as bright. It'll be like the, the light of the day, but, but like it'll be seven times as bright. And if you look at that being reflected light from the sun, then you'd say, wow, if the sun's light was seven times brighter than it is now, we'd all cook, fry, and die. But it's light in a particular wavelength, so you don't particularly burn, you know, like infrared but it gets so bright, it's, it's the radiation is chewing through your skin. And that, I think, is what the Bible is talking about. It, men will hide in caves and throw rocks on them to hide them from the wrath of the Almighty, being the energy coming from the sun, and our shields being down. And, and the ultraviolet penetration can be seven times as bright. It's blue-white, but it's not cooking you like you know pure sunlight would at the beach. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you can't hide from it. You know, it... it uh, I'm sure that along with it, there will be an increase in infrared radiation. And I'm sure at that time that our roads that have asphalt or tar in them will melt and tires will melt and explode on cars and things like that. Uh, It's going to get hot. And what we're seeing now with the sun is leading the way to what may very well be in the prophecy. And I'll tell you, Stan, I noticed uh, just last summer, um, you know, I used to be, I worked outside most of my life and, um, you know, I never burned up. I always, you know, tanned gradually. And last summer, I mean, I got out in the sun, I think I was uh, probably within 15, 20 minutes, and I had burns on my neck, burns on my arms. Where are you, you looking know, at? In uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And, uh, right. yeah, I fried. Right. Yeah. That is, so, that's up, uh, yeah, that's up about 35 degrees north latitude. Yeah, if you'd have been down, well, actually, you were just above where that the islands down there. I was talking about off the north coast of South America, where uh, the South Atlantic anomaly causes people to have trouble there on the island. I don't know where this thing was last year, but uh, normally it stays down in the South Atlantic, and it's not a problem. But it spreads out to be a big hole periodically. So you may have you may mm. have caught something there. On the yeah, quite possibly. All right, Stan, uh, hang on for a moment. We've got to take a break big time uh, with your website. I mean, you really do keep the information flowing over there. Um, well, that's Holly. It's like she does that every, every, well, six days a week. She gets up at 4.30 to do that. So I, I kind of read it uh, when I get time, uh, you know, like the rest of you. But she puts all that up there. Wow, it's a lot of work. I know. It is. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, you know, Stan, I was saving this for later, but I'll get to it now because a lot of people who are listening are curious as to where you stand with the whole Planet X scenario. Um, a lot of people believe that that has something to do with the sun's activity and the changes on the planet. Where where do you stand uh, with that whole scenario? Well, as yet, I've not seen any proof that such a planet is approaching uh, close enough to do us any damage. 
Um, there, I mean, for years, NASA has been looking for a mystery tenth planet that was perturbing the orbits of Uranus and uh, Neptune, you know, compressing them down a bit from where they should be. But the, I mean, I've, I've recently, I guess in the last week, I've gotten some emails saying they've got photos of it uh, taken in the southern hemisphere because you can't see it in the northern hemisphere, and that might be true. I have done studies with the um, um, uh, with Excel and, and and doing formulas for the orbits of the planets and the speeds of them, this kind of thing, and so I plugged into my my uh, uh, computational formula there the theoretical data for you know where the orbits of planets have to be or where they can be stable around our sun, and in the process of re- researching, I found a formula that fits our solar system perfectly, and it tells you where a planet has to orbit rather than using what's called Bode's Law, which is a guess. Uh, this was a uh, first principle calculation of the volume of space around the sun and differences going out. Now, having said that, I calculated the stable orbits for planets around the sun going out, you know, probably 2,000 times the distance of Earth to see, you know, how many orbits would be stable. And I found one that was, I think it was at about... Gosh, was it 75 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun? It mean mean orbit. Anyway, I did find one out there and calculated its uh, velocity, which is a, you know assuming it has an elliptical orbit around the Sun, and was able to find that a planet could exist in that orbit. And to my surprise, the orbital time of that going around the Sun once would be, believe it or not, 3,611 years. You know, plus or minus oh, wow. about 10 years. And uh, what, and that's supposed to be the orbit of this Nibiru, this planet X, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a stable orbit there that you know fits the the, the timing of what they talk about as planet X. Now we are seeing more surprise meteors uh, striking the Earth of late, or coming close, even even becoming meteorites. We're seeing uh, it would appear more uh, comet grazing, or sorry, sun grazing comets which have gotten too close to the sun as they passed around and caused coronal mass ejections to rip off the sun just after the the uh, grazer, the, the comet grazer, passes the sun's surface at close point. We've got one, this comet Ison, down in, in uh, November. Um, it's probably going to cause massive coronal mass ejections on the surface of the sun as it goes around. This is part of a, a bunch of debris that may be triggered by a larger mass moving in our solar system. I do not think that we're going to see a large planetary body, you know, like the planet X type thing, come close to the Earth at all. But will we suffer uh, effects from it if such a, a thing does exist and does come into the uh, the minor planet's uh, sphere of influence here inside the orbit of Jupiter? It could um, disrupt our orbits, even though they don't come close to the planet itself or planets themselves, it can cause shock waves in the um, the fluid of space, let's call it, uh, the, the fabric of space, which is what causes a stable orbit to form. And if it shakes that, then it could affect the length of our year, the spin of our planet, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, heating, cooling, and, ra- and strange places. A lot of things could happen. But as yet, I haven't seen data that I would say, yeah, the planet X is there and they're holding it back. And I've got astronomer friends, you know, amateurs that have got big enough stuff, except for infrared scopes, to be able to see such an object as that, and they would tell me. But so far, I've gotten no proof in. Fascinating. You know, I've I've seen uh, evidence. Well, I won't say evidence, but I've seen uh, good material on both sides of the argument. Um, and certainly, I'm where you are. I think that it's very possible um, that. This thing could be out there. Um, I have seen pictures and videos, but again, you know, I don't know the people personally who are taking the pictures and, and putting the videos out there. Um, I can only say, like I tell everybody who listens, you know, you, you you can deny a lot, but you can't deny that we're definitely going through changes. Whatever you think might be causing them, fine. The fact is, it's happening. And uh, you know, NASA actually put out uh, an article not long ago. I had shared it with the listeners here on this show a few nights ago, uh, that they have found that there's uh, apparently a couple brown dwarf stars that are in some kind of uh, orbit behind the sun somewhere. So I don't know if that might be uh Well, no, I hadn't seen that. 
I hadn't seen that. No? I'd, I'd have to look that up to to, to talk on it. But it, it would obviously be way out. I don't think it's within the um, the um, what do they call it? The, the solar mean solar diameter or the system diameter because the sun's influence, the, the actual solar system envelope, goes out so far that if you went to the edge of our solar system and travel at the speed of light through the center of the solar system to the other side, that you would take a year to get from one side of our solar system to the other. That's the farthest extent. Now, if those two brown dwarf stars are out there, they, I don't know that they would be inside that sphere, um, you know, the, the uh, heliopause or, or not. But uh, I, I, well, look. It's kind of academic at this point to argue the point. We've got something hard to do. Some of those videos you're talking about, I got a video and I got pictures from people over in California saying, look here, here's the sun that almost at sunset and off to the lower left was, you know, Planet X, you know, right there on the on the photograph and on the video. Well, I got the time that the guy took the picture, where he was standing, what the date was, and put it into Stellarium and put myself in his position and wound it back. And it was... A, a not totally uncommon thing for the moon to set at the same time close to the sun there, and what he was, and I, I wound it back to the minute where he was standing, looking at his photographs. They had a time stamp on them, and it was the moon. Just at sunset, it's enlarged because of it's on the horizon and the, the air is there's more air between you and that, so optically it expands it bigger, like a magnifying glass. And it was the moon, but they were all getting excited. Oh, Planet X, you know, a mystery thing by the sun. Wow. And so I, I saw zillions of emails come by and, log, you know, people on blogs talking about it. And I thought, well, I'm not going to argue with them, but there it is. You know, one little misstep and the, the Internet goes wild. Yeah, and, you, and know, you know, I've been guilty of that myself. I've gone out there and I've taken pictures and, you know, uh, you briefly will get excited and think, hey, I, you know, and not that I want to find this thing. I hope that it's not true. But, uh, you know, I tend to think that there's something up there. I just don't know if it's as bad as everybody's been saying it is, if it's going to come as close as everyone thinks it is. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there we don't know about. And we have been getting a lot of close objects to the planet lately, asteroids and comets, uh, you know, impacting. And it would make one think, okay, why is all this happening all of a sudden? So. You know, I had to ask the question. <laughs> well, there are changes. Uh, have you ever read uh, any of Emmanuel Velikovsky's works? Uh, uh, no, Earth sir. Up people, Worlds in Collision. Well, he uh, he did a very in-depth study in several books on the ancient world and the legends uh, that people talked about the gods fighting in the sky and this and that, and related it back to astronomical events. One of the things I found interesting was that he from the uh, ancient legends uh, in one of the cultures, I forget which it was, they talked about uh, this object in the sky, really, uh, calling it a god, that came across the sky and had made war with another one and then moved on in toward the, the, the sun in the sky. Now, he put that down. He, he did a much better job than I'm doing here of describing it, and it was the planet Venus. Now, Mars, you know, god of war, you know, from the old legends, he thinks would have been evolved. He thinks that Venus could have been uh, either a planet that was, say, in the asteroid belt originally or further out that came wandering in and bounced through the orbits until it took up a stable orbit where it is now. It is the only planet in our system that we know of that rotates backwards to everybody else. And it's slowing up, and I think eventually it will flip over and right itself because these stable orbits demand that everything rotate the same way with the sun eventually if you want to be stable. So this is a recent event, and it's still slowing down. There are pieces of debris in the asteroid belt. If you add up, it doesn't make a very big planet at all. But then Mars, right next to the asteroid belt, has two moons that are odd-shaped rocks that NASA thinks one of them may even be hollow at the moment. But uh, on the surface of Mars itself, there's a large scar made by the impact of uh, a small moon I calculated uh, roughly three to 400 miles in diameter that broke up, and when it did, the, the fan-shaped impact that was spread around the surface of Mars at the uh, northern edge of it is the Cydonia area where they have all those crystalline shapes that came out of the inside of a small moon. 
these things all tell us that there are things that do change position in our system. And right now, it may be one of those times. Yeah, it might be. Now, you said NASA actually believes that one of these uh, moons might might be hollow? They actually yeah. said that? I'm surprised. Yeah, um, it's hollow or have cavities in it. And I've looked at the imagery and data on it, and it's possible. It's a very odd-looking moon. Um with one end of it that looks kind of like the the dish on the front of the Starship Enterprise, covered with dust that's had impacts of one or two strikes of some other object in orbit or somewhere else. Uh, but it doesn't behave as though it were solid all the way through, you know, gravitationally or inertially or whatever. Uh, and I just read the article just a few days ago. I'd have to look it up to tell you where. But, um, yeah, there, there's something odd about it. And, you know, of course, the underground is saying, aha, it's really a spaceship put up by some culture, blah, 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 and it's you know lost in the dust of time collected on it. And that may be true, but uh, I don't think NASA is saying that at all. It's just saying it, it's a kind of a porous or uh, a rock with cavities in it because its mass density doesn't match what it should be for the type of rock that, that they see on it. Anyway, it's worth you know, people looking into. I'd, I'd uh, certainly encourage people to look that up. Yeah, I've been told by many that they believe the our moon is hollow, and you know I don't know. I, I guess I'd have to go up there and see it for myself. You know, I guess anything's possible. But uh, um, let me no agree doubt. with you. Let me agree with you. I think that the moon could very well be hollow. Most planets and moons do have cavities of emptiness inside of them. Small moons end up having just one cavity. As they, have you ever seen a geode and in, in, you know picked up one of those round rocks that they cut open at the gym shows, all the little crystals inside? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now think about it. that's a solid stone that was you know burped up from some volcano, thrown into the air and cooled as it was coming down, and it was full of spinning you know magma from the volcano. So it cooled over a period of time, and when it cooled and we came along here a few thousand years later and broke it open, we find that it's not solid all the way through. It has a cavity in the center. It is hollow. And that's because when it cooled, the mass inside there, or when it cooled slowly, let me say, the mass inside there started to make crystals on the outer side where it was cooler. And those crystals took up less space than they did as random molecules floating around in this hot state. As they crystallized completely, it left nothing but a vacuum, you know, an open space there inside that stone. And it's an oversimplification of the gravitational process, but I think that all moons, all uh, planets, and possibly stars, as well as galaxies, have um, a hollow core or a hollow shell or shells within them. I mean, even now they say our galaxy, the Milky Way, has a supermassive black hole in the center of it. Now, that's a kind of cavity and a kind of hollowness, and I think it probably is because it sucks in mass and energy and burps it out at the polar regions every now and then as super intense uh, gamma rays and other types of uh, radiation it shoots out. And then it closes up the poles and starts gathering more energy. So, yes, I think the moon could very well have cooled slowly and that the core of it uh, is vacant. I don't know how thick the surface would be, but the the early seismographic tests on the moon from the Apollo series did indicate that it rang like a bell. And duh, <laughs> that's all. Yeah. Now, uh, do you think they've been totally honest with us as far as... Um, uh, not, I have no doubt that they went to the moon. Um, my doubts have kind of been on what they've told us about what they found on the moon. Do you think they've uh, been... Honest, or do you think they're hiding something up there? I don't think they've been uh, uh, truthful with us on it. I do think there are things they've left out of the press on purpose. Um, I think that they tolerate the alien UFO scenarios around the planet, uh, you know, as long as it suits their purposes to hide other things. But when you get too close to it and start saying, well, okay, we found evidence of, uh, you know, intelligent life had built buildings or something on the moon or, you know, then it starts to to become a serious issue the government has to address. The biggest problem is this. Until you have a one-world government, the 
telling people that, you know, the gods have returned uh, and we're we're keeping from it, we're going to let you know now, telling people this is going to absolutely knock the slats out from under all the different religions and uh, and, uh, political structures built upon that, you know, cultural structures. It would it would almost produce, uh, without doubt, anarchy across the planet. That's why I think that we're headed for a one-world government rapidly, and they will be announcing then some of the stuff, uh, not all of it, I'm sure, but some of the stuff that they've been hiding. And I know, having worked on one project, that today even you don't know, the public doesn't know that we have anti-gravity and have built our own saucer craft and, you know, can... Uh, walk through solid metal doors inside of the craft by pushing a button and, and cutting a door out and then putting it back in place and re-welding it just at the push of a button. You know, these are things that are science fiction in, in the ultimate, but, uh, you know, we've had them for a number of decades now. That's fascinating right there. Now, uh, you know, so I've been saying for a while that I think some of the uh, crafts that people um, say that they've seen, and I've seen some myself, you know, some could be very well be our own governments, and oh, that would say that they've got the technology from ET, maybe. Well, not necessarily. Uh, some of it, yes. The early days of this, um, there was um, there were some engineers who um, did kind of stumble onto the idea in the oh mid fifties, I think it was. Now, it could have been that they stumbled onto it with a bit of help, and that's just the explanation that I was told. Uh, but basically, you know, they they observed the solar system and the galaxy and, and other galaxies in the, in the universe, and they saw they all had spiral uh, motion to them around the center. And from that, they determined what gravity was. It was the sum of two waveforms, spinning waveforms, uh, reflecting from space itself back into the, the spinning system. And from that, they were able to determine how gravity, which appears to be a one-dimensional force, you know, one direction, is really the sum of two uh, forces acting, one toward the planet, one away from it, or one from uh, toward the surface of the sun or away from it, etc. It's the sum of two. And the net result is at our uh, radius from the center of our planet that we're attracted or appear to be attracted down toward the, the core of the planet. But anyway, they, they did figure this out, and... But there were other things, I'm sure, that were part of the agreement with the alleged, um, quote-unquote, aliens, uh, that um, in, in the early 50s, in the agreement we had within the treaty, that they would give us technology in return for letting them do some genetic experiments on livestock and, and humans. It didn't go too well after that. But anyway, that was – so some of, some of it was our stuff, some of it was theirs. And we have tried to develop things, I'm sure, as we were doing at the time, even up to the late 70s, develop our own technologies away from the shared facilities that our scientists had with these uh, gray-looking critters, usually underground and under the ice cap at the South Pole. I see. Now uh, now we're talking about the whole UFO thing, um, I guess, in the one world government. I'm wondering, uh, what do you think is going to become? I mean, we've got uh, Korea, China. Uh, Russia, uh, you know, and it seems like this Obama administration has been more of a dictation. Um, you know, we have the missile missile shield anomaly going on, and, uh, you know, it seems like if earth changes don't kill us, uh, you know, maybe these wars uh, might. Uh, what do you think is going to happen here? I mean, do you think this is all a distraction uh, for possibly bringing on a false flag alien attack type deal or or what do you think? Well, that was originally the plan. Uh, if there were no aliens, we were going to invent them. And it was a simple reason. Uh, after the close of World War II and uh, the results of the two atom bombs over Japan, the Western world, the, the Allies, they said, look, we cannot afford the next war. It will, it will decimate the planet, and there won't be any winners in that. So they said, uh, look... <clears throat> We've seen the League of Nations fail, and we've seen the United Nations uh, already failing in its infancy, where you've got now like 196 member nations, and you've got to try to get two or three of them to agree on a common point, and that's difficult. Needless to say, 196 of them to get them to agree on a common religion, a common economy, common laws, common culture, going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible. They also knew that Hitler had tried to use force to 
uh, get, say, like France to join the uh, the German Union, as it were. And the resistance in France kept blowing up bridges, uh, killing uh, officers and people in the uh, Nazi hierarchy there in France. So the French resistance was an example of how people would not toe in. They would they would find ways to sabotage a forced order. They said, well, how can we get the people? Well, we can get the leaders of various countries to agree. They're, they're easy to manipulate. But how can we get the people, the masses, who have been raised with various cultural and religious biases to agree to change everything in favor of a one-world religion, a one-world culture, and all this kind of stuff? How can we do that? And basically what, what the third option was, alternative three, was this. We will fly in an alien landing all over the planet. We will develop the technology quietly underground, and we will confront the people of the world with a group of individuals with advanced technology and allegedly from off the planet in a peaceful place, you know, the Federation of Planets or whatever, and say, look, we can let you be a victim of the crisis curves now facing you and your eventual destruction of each other by a nuclear war, or we can show you how we do it and set up a friendly one-planet government with one leader, and uh, we it will have a, an equal economy for everyone. We'll get rid of poverty. We'll heal cancer, all this kind of stuff. Now, people need to think that they are in trouble. And certainly there have been things exaggerated in the media for several decades now, and they're getting worse, about the threat of, okay, uh, meteor impacts destroying life, you know, extinction-level event, earthquakes, you know, big threat, uh, diseases, pandemics, big threat, nuclear war, big threat, collapse of the world economy, big threat, overpopulation and dwindling resources and famine, emerging threat right now. Now, these can be played up and exaggerated in the press to get people's attention if need be, and I think that's in some cases what is happening. Far in advance of the actual events becoming a problem, these are being played up so that people all over the world are saying, oh, man, man, if one thing doesn't get you, then the other one will. And, you know, what are the odds that we can beat all six or seven of these major crisis curves that we know about? Oh, alien invasion, that's not really on our radar at the moment, as much as these other things that are real practical dangers that we can see every day in the news and we can touch and feel. Yet the planners said, look, okay, if we do fly in this crowd and we do convince them to try that one more government for long enough that they can see that it works and we can have a peaceful planet, then we will have saved the planet from the next war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You and I both know, if you study prophecy, that this is what is happening now, is that a great deception is at foot. This alleged alien business, I, although I never met any of these great critters when I worked uh, with uh, Dr. Teller's group developing anti-gravity and stuff, I heard about them. And as far as I'm concerned, they they had no soul. They were they were biological robots, cyborgs, if you wish, that performed the duties of the real uh, aliens, if you wish, which were Satan and those who came with him when they were kicked out of the heavens above us, you know, the, the parallel universe, into the earth for one last great battle. And all of these greys are were nasty critters that, that we had to deal with and they were doing experiments and abductions on people and mutilating cattle and stuff. Basically, they frightened the people of the earth that they were here and our governments wouldn't admit it to us. Oh, what are they keeping a secret for? These things are terrible, getting worse and worse. They are the enemy. Now, Satan and his uh, minions that look kind of, they're, they're basically human, will appear with their technology right at the height of our crisis curve when we think the end is near and offer us that solution. They're going to do what we were planning to do after World War II, you know, as a psychological method of trying to unify the planet. Satan is going to do that, and he's going to appoint and support a human uh, dictator of the planet, basically a king, they will call him, but basically it'll be a dictator. Using their technology, he will bring all the nations to heal and make them form this one-world government. The people really won't have to be drug in because it'll be someone that's offering them goodies, you know, free energy, anti-gravity, new medicine, uh, this kind of stuff. And with beings like, like Satan who have lived and still are living, who have lived a long time, thousands of years, if not longer, they can produce video and audio 
records of even the crucifixion of Jesus himself because they were there at the time passing through. So this will certainly open people's eyes when they see this and say, wow, that's really incredible. This must be, you know, the Messiah's team here. And this is what what we're headed for. That's the next major event, the Grand Deception, and why uh, it is in play. Whether man does it or whether Satan does it, that will be the next thing. And this will be a deception headed up by an evil character. And for a few years, it will work, but that's all. So now, what if uh, the real uh, Messiah shows up, or what if uh, real aliens were to show up? I mean, how would we know the difference? So we'd get fooled either way, even though we know about this. It's such a clever deception that even the very elect, uh, Matthew 24 says, would not be able to tell the difference. But basically, it's the degree of technology. If they say the Messiah is here in this secret place or in orbit or somewhere else, you can visit him there if we give you permission, then they are not the real dudes. Jesus says, when I return with my army to claim the title deed to earth and set it up properly, everything, everything, every living thing on the planet will know that I am coming. All the nations will see me as I come in the clouds of heaven at once. As the lightning flashes from the east to the west, you will see me. It won't be limited to little spaceships going around that are a mile in diameter and stuff floating over cities and impressing people. Uh, He will not hide. Everyone will see him, and he won't need TV to do it. Every living thing will feel and, and sense his presence one way or another. So it does tell you that's the real Messiah. The make believes are here only with technology they've been able to put together here on the earth since they arrived because they were kicked out of the heavens and they didn't get to take much with them. That's why they made a deal with us in the early 50s at Holloman Air Force Base to have joint research facilities underground and hidden away from the human uh, you know, mob so that they could develop their own technologies, but mainly so they could also develop infrastructure to build those technologies way in advance of what we even know now, even having worked with them. It was infrastructure they needed to build the weapons. So when you see beings allegedly from off the planet, well, they are. They're, they're not from around here, but they're from the heavens. When you see them using limited technology and not across the heavens, like Jesus is talking about, it will be planetary, you know, planet-wide. It will be amazing, brilliant, and not hidden away. He will come and you'll see him. All eyes will see him. You won't have to go to a secret place to meet him or, or film him. The one so that but- is... I was going to say, so basically, if E.T. Uh, should land and say, take me to your leader, uh, then he might be okay. But if he comes down and says, hey, I'm the Messiah, uh, Jesus, obviously, I don't think he'd have to say something like that. I think he'd feel it. Oh, um, you'd know it. If, yeah. And, and the E.T. But, you're talking about, I think that this is a protected planet under the current uh, reason for mankind being here. It's part of a virtual courtroom to settle a dispute in the heavens. You know, uh, the Stargates are not a new invention. They were talked about in the Book of Ezekiel and, and uh, the Tower of uh, Nimrod, uh, the Tower of Babel, which Nimrod built. All these indicate about the the gates to the parallel universe that, that our scientists are just now recognizing. So, um, like a, a protective veil, if you wish, or like a shield around Earth, only allowing what is happening now, the beings that were cast out and humans to exist in here, and beings from other worlds, other galaxies, other star systems, I don't even know if they're, if they're there or if this whole thing is a, a total uh, uh, virtual reality, the whole universe. But they will not be allowed to screw up what is happening as far as I know. And this will go according to plan as it is in the book of the Revelation of John and the book of Daniel. Okay. Well, let's take a call, Stan. We've got uh, Papa Bear uh, on the line. Uh, Papa Bear, are you with us? Hey, yes, I am. Good evening. How are you? Good evening. I've been hearing you talk about uh, anti-gravity and and such like that. Do you have any like blueprints, blueprints or plans for anti-gravity or uh, uh, cold fusion energy or something like that? To be released, no. Um, do I know how it works? Yes. Uh, in fact, I am writing a paper on the general theory, but not with circuit diagrams uh, for a number of very practical reasons at this point. But um, I can tell you that uh, 
gravity, and, and hence anti-gravity, if you want to call it that, is a function of um, a complex interaction between two current-carrying conductors, uh, like coils. And they are at right angles and wrapped in a spiral thing around a, a donut, if you wish, a torus, with a chunk cut out of it on one side, uh, about oh, an eighth of the, the circle cut out. You can pulse energy, electricity, into one coil and then release the pulse. And as you get the back EMF from that pulse, you trap that, sending it into the other coil, which is at right angles uh, everywhere it's, it's winding, so it's the other coil. And add to that pulse another input. So now you've got two pulses of input in the second coil. You release it, and you've got two pulses coming back as back EMF. You direct those into the first uh, coil and add another. Now you have three direct current pulses, and you keep doing this until you build up the limit of the field, which basically is the resistive, uh, the pure resistive load of the um, the, the coils. Uh, in 30-foot diameter crafts that we were uh, building, the coils were about, uh, the wire in them were flat wire, about, I think it's four and a half to five inches wide by about half inch thick. Uh, they had to be built in sections and clipped together because it was hard to, to, to bend them. But, okay. um, yeah, okay. that's, that's anti-gravity. The the reason why I asked is because uh, this is a, a Dr. Kesh with uh, uh, the Kesh Foundation. He's from Iran, and he did release uh, information on how to make those items. That's why I was wondering. Did you uh, read his uh, documents on the, the uh, anti-gravity stuff? Did you see them? I, I do have them, yes. I, I've looked over them briefly. I've only had them for about two days now. Um, but, yes, I have looked over them briefly, and uh, I'm still doing some more studying. Does he have any spin or spiral circuits in there at all? Um, I believe so. I'd have to look at it again. But he also uses gases in there. There's uh, certain gases like nitrogen and argon and some others. Well, I don't know why he would be releasing that, but um, uh, the... Gravity is a function of spin of the fine structure of space. The mm, well, what James Clark Maxwell, uh, a couple of uh, centuries back, called the ether space, a e t h e r space. It's a fine structure, fluid, and it behaves like a fluid. And the spin around a central point is what produces gravity. And a byproduct of gravity, uh, or in, incorporated in it, are magnetic fields that are dynamic fields created by this spin around a central point in the fluid of space. No object that has gravity will be without spin. Exactly. It'll either have the spin of its atoms or it'll have the spin of itself. But there's molecular gravity and then there's object gravity above that. Right, okay. Yeah, I, I do get these... Uh, these Basic blueprints, they're, they're not exact, they're not, they're not made out to scale or anything like that. You know, that's something I'll have to figure out on my own. But uh, I think the reason why he released these is because, uh, first of all, anybody who's tried to sell anything for profit has wound up, uh, oh, shall we say, missing. <laughs> you know how that goes, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, what is, is uh, his... Uh is this website like the the big picture, the 2012 big picture, or is it something else? Cash Foundation. No, no, it's uh, it's uh, uh, cashfoundation dot org. K e s h e. O s h e. Right. I'm just looking up while we're talking to see, uh, and I had misspelled it. Uh, right. There's quite a bit there. I mean, the technology he has is not just anti gravity and cold fusion. Is also uh, things for health benefits and stuff like that. Also, things for extracting elements and so on. Now, does he charge anything for blueprints or whatever? Or data? No, sir. Uh, not that I know of. All right. All right. Just curious to see if it was a, kind of a subtle scam or whether it was a, truly a... <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, I've also... Uh, encountered another place called the uh, One People's Public Trust, and they're distributing those blueprints on their site as well. It's it's a 
Well, a whole lot is going on nowadays, so, and that's that's quite you know another part of it. Hmm. Well, I you know being basically ignorant of his uh, his website and details of it, I just now looked at it. Uh, you know, thirty seconds. I can't really comment with authority on what he is saying and how close it is to what we were doing, but. Um, it is interesting if he is uh, truly releasing it. Now, what did you say he was a uh, Iranian or Iraqi? What he he's uh, he's Iranian. He's from Iran. Uh huh. He was. Yeah, and this is the guy who cl- this is the guy who uh, claimed that he had um, developed a anti gravity, I guess, a UFO. Um, and Iran's president came out and said that he had that technology, right? Is that right? Well, actually, uh, he's passed this on to a whole bunch of different governments. Uh, the U.S. was the last one to actually accept it. And, of course, it changes the whole game. You know, it's, it's a game changer, especially when, you, when you know, you're creating your own force fields. Um, it's, it's all for uh, peaceful purposes. None of, it is, none of it is warfare at all. Well, I'm, I'm kind of surprised at this, I guess. Our government could have been, you know, playing dumb, but we we had that in the late fifties already, and so why would they even talk to this guy? Oh, exactly. Well, I'm I'm not sure. This I mean, what I don't understand. I mean, uh, well, that type of technology isn't widely broadcast. You know what I mean? It's it's very hush hush. It, it's something that they don't want the people to know. I don't care how long they've had it. Probably since uh, the, before the sixties. You know. Well, are you saying that? Though, but when did he re- release it to the U.S. government in, in modern times? Oh yeah, yeah. From what I saw in the paperwork, but I mean, that could be why they, you know, they wrote it off. But it could be they took it just to patronize him. I really don't know. I don't either. I mean, he was born in 1958. I'm seeing here on his website, it's flashing up. By the time he, when he was just born, we already had anti gravity, and we're building, you know, craft. So. Well, exactly. I mean, mm. they had the Bell. Uh, you know, Germany. The Nazis had, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And who knows what's going on in, in you know in uh, Antarctica? Well, that's high jump, and so we had a base down there under the ice cap that you could only get to by submarine. I'm pretty sure it was with the the, the German scientists and engineers that got away. I mean, there's a, quite a bit of study on uh, before World War II about the Germans going down to the South Pole and uh, eventually setting up uh, New Schwabenland, um, and it was under the ice pack and tunnels that went under there and. Long, long stretches where you had air bubbles and you had uh, warm, you know, cavities to to build bases in. Right. So well, you know, the, yeah. it's, it kind of makes me curious. I mean, we've had this technology for almost half a century, but none of it's getting out. I mean, it, what's you know, I, I don't understand the reasoning behind it. Well, it's all in in, in an effort to set up a peaceful one world government. Uh, and you know it was a desperate move after World War II ended, as I was saying earlier in the program, to convince people to try a new one-world uh, government, economy, you know, political structure, etc., uh, and religion, so that long enough so that they could show the people of Earth that we could all get along with different languages, whatever, and we could you know uh, equalize inequalities in, in uh, living standards and, and stuff like that. But to do that, there had to be uh, a release of technology from some group that had no relig- religious connections to any country or any culture, did not appear to be from around here. They had no drum to beat. They came to help us in a time of crisis. That has to be a quote-unquote alien landing. And to do that with even, as I was saying, with Satan and the fallen ones being involved in our, in our program, even with them it took a finite amount of time to develop spacecraft and technologies here, you know, from Earth-based uh, infrastructure manufacturing processes, it took a finite amount of time, which we're coming to the end of, to build craft that would be a mile in diameter and, and still not fall apart from their own weight, as modern uh, you know, engineers would tell you that's impossible, but using gravitational nodes throughout the thing every 30 feet, it was not a problem. To show that kind of stuff takes time to actually build it, even underwater or under ice, and then get it out and test it, and then fly over and show people to impress them with the fact you've come from somewhere way out there and with this technology. That's right, why it's been held back. What I don't understand most is the cold fusion technology. It's proven to work, although you know a lot of it's quantum energy. 
uh, dark matter and such. But it does work, and it's you know it doesn't require you know there's there's no hazards from it. it it's all yeah. clean, clean energy. You know, I mean, and why we're you know we've got this infatuation with oil and such. You know, it really I don't know. I'm puzzled. I'm going I'm to tell you from inside the organization why that is. They will release that technology to the public once they have secured a global government. The problem is is that the, the Crusades are still being fought. Uh, the old cotton tops that ran my group down in Australia, uh, at lunch one day I got a clue to it, and basically what they are trying to do is to lock up all of our free energy electrical devices, and, and the coal fusion is one of them, and there's a thermionic device, and there's an atmospheric uh, converter, a number of things that are not being released to the public on a commercial scale, so that we will continue to burn up the oil of the uh, Islamic countries. You know, we want to deplete their oil, which is the only thing they've got to offer the world as far as a commercial reality. Burn their oil up and so that they are now totally dependent on us, our oil, our energy. And it was a crusade thing continued in our generation. The, the, the Jewish, Christian, Western nations against the Islamic nations, and it was an effort to win this battle rather than the one that we lost when Saladin took over, you know, Jerusalem in the old days. Uh, well, that... That's kind of what puzzles me, though. I mean, we're not going to deplete their oil system, you know, their oil supply. We would have made a massive dent in it by now, and we haven't. Meanwhile, we're polluting the earth, and we're creating more wars. And it seems to me like it's all kind of based around a monetary system, which is, uh, for the most part, slavery. Well... Uh, all I can tell you is what uh, what I heard in the conversation, and that was their their game plan was to uh, to isolate the oil supplies from the uh, Muslim nations using theirs, burning them up in up in uh, uh, Desert Storm One and Two, uh, catch an oil field on fire. That's not a problem. Let it burn for a while, then put it out, deplete the oil, and um, let them build large buildings and places and spend their money where it's going to be virtually useless to make an their ability. I see. Well, I thank you for your input. Your, your, it was quite helpful. Thank you very much. You bet you. Thank you, Papa Bear. Appreciate the call, my friend. And uh, you know, uh, one thing's for sure is the, you know, the wars continue because you know there's corporations and and people who are getting rich off of it. And uh, you know, it's for, it's for many reasons. And you know, the one world government. I guess in a perfect world, that would be nice. It's a nice thought, but um, I kind of like our borders right now, and <laughs> I'd like to keep them. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, w if you have a uh, righteous person in charge of the planet, the one world government, like the Messiah will be, then, yeah, I'm in favor of a one world government. And I, sometimes I start lectures out like that when we're talking about that kind of stuff, and I'll say, well, yeah, look, I'm in favor of a one world government. And everybody goes, <gasps> Really? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Run by the right person, you know, the right group. And, uh, you know, that's that's the bottom line. Um, we're pretty fallible. I couldn't run a one-world government, you know, even if I had, you know, good advisors and, and stuff like that. I, I would make a mistake one day. I would get mad at somebody who didn't do something they were supposed to do and crunch them with the power of, of the office. And once you take that step once, you're you're in trouble from there on. Many dictators have proved that, so... It takes someone yeah. who has the blueprint to the planet and to us to know exactly how to do it and not make mistakes. Absolutely. Hey, Stan, before our next break comes up here, uh, we got a break in about nine minutes, and I want to come back and finish up with you. But I have uh, another question I want to get out there, and it's uh, whether you've seen these videos um, that others have been sharing on YouTube in different places. They're, uh, they record through uh, night vision gear. Um, and what looks to be like thousands of UFOs in the upper atmosphere, and, you know, within close space of our planet. And I've seen these videos, and it's just amazing, all the objects that are flying around up there. Uh, have you uh, taken a peek at any of this? Well, I've looked at it myself with uh, night vision, uh, you know, uh, Gen 4 stuff. And there are a lot of things moving around out there. Uh, uh, Earth-made satellites that we're aware of, there are at least 5,000 of them in orbit around the planet more going up and some coming down. There are fast-moving things, um, you know, um, fast walkers, if you wish, way up there high, which could be theirs or our craft moving 
somewhere around the earth. But it is interesting. It's like looking in a in a uh, pond, you know, with a microscope and seeing all the life forms zipping around in there. It's busy. Yeah, it's very busy. And, you know, I thought, well, okay, some of that's probably satellites. Some of that's probably meteorites and so on. But uh, then there's others that you know, you'll see them hauling butt, then they stop. And they start going the other way, and I'm thinking, okay, well, that's not a meteorite. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. <laughs> our our so, class can do that, but that's, you know, yeah, whatever it is. I don't know who yeah. it is or what they're doing. All right. All right. Hang on with me, Stan. We're going to take our uh, last break with you here, and then Stan Dale's website. And Stan, uh, something we haven't talked too much about here tonight, uh, I don't know if we've touched on it at all, but that's the – the oceans rising. Um, you know, it's been brought to my attention that they have been rising steadily. Um, I see a map also on your website um, with uh, it had to do with sea level rises. Can you explain that just a little bit? Well, that map is showing uh, if just the polar ice caps melted rapidly, what sea level changes would take place on the coast of the United States. Now, on the right side of the map, from the uh, east coast of Texas all the way to the Atlantic, those uh, shades of blue show from 100 feet and 200 feet and 500 feet intrusion by different shades. The the likelihood of that happening is probably mm, better now because of the sun and the heat coming from it and the increased heating that, that is occurring in the melting of the poles. However, this is not enough to do more than about two to 500 feet maximum. The current figures released are 200 foot of sea level rise. Now, that would be pretty disastrous because, gosh, nearly 75 to 80 percent of the world live close to the coastal regions of their countries and estuaries that feed in or are fed by the ocean. Now, on the left side of that map, I have a, a different shade of blue and an a, in a explanation of it showing what the Hopi prophecies say is that northern Arizona, where they are, that they will be going between their mesas by canoe or boat when the earth changes take place on the west coast. Now, they live uh, about a mile above sea level. That's just kind of pretty hard to do with the amount of water we've got on the planet, on the surface anyway. It would take a release of large amounts of the water stored in the Moho discontinuity about 5 to 15 miles deep under the surface of the earth. The the other way is that California could drop down or uh, the, the ocean could rise up uh, and the coast drop down, and perhaps massive earthquake movements under California and Arizona would drop the Hopi Reservation down to a level where it would be inundated by water from the sea or at least come between the mesas. Now, another study, which uh, I was... Uh, led to do by a woman uh, scientist who was familiar with the area, and she said, look, what happens if we have an earthquake that causes the Grand Canyon to block up just you know, south of the area where the Hopi and the Navajo live, and the Colorado River flow and all the tributaries would flood that area? And I did run that some, and I've put that on the website as well uh, under the, uh, the uh, links to show images, which I don't see up there at the moment, but anyway... Um, uh, somewhere down there, we have a link to show images on our website uh, where it says Dan's interview show images by the microphone. I don't know that, whether that's where you went or not, but uh, <clears throat> I, as far as I could calculate it with the, the normal flow rates of the Colorado River, even if you blocked it off, it might take 15 to 20 years to fill up that area where the Hopi are, you know, to sea level or, or to level between it, so you'd have to go by boat to get between the three mesas. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's 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 why that map is in there. It's just to show the uh, – to fulfill prophecy by coastal flooding is almost impossible. It's going to have to be something else that causes that uh, water to flow between the mesas there. On the east coast, on the, the right side of the map, all those are very accurate as far as water inundation. If the land stays at the same level it's at and doesn't drop any further or rise any further. I see. And, you know, uh, what I find with a lot of people um, who aren't in the know about this type of thing, um, they go on and they just think that everything's going to be the same forever. And they they just ignore 
um, past history and records that show that, you know, the earth has gone through these type of changes before. And, uh, you know, all I tell people is that they should be prepared because you never know what's going to come. And we've seen the weather uh, pick up, uh, super storms, uh, the earthquakes have picked up, uh, the geoengineering, uh, which I feel is a major problem and certainly contributing to some of our changes. Um, you know, what do you suggest people should do uh, as far as being prepared? Because that's something I usually like to talk about. Um, when we speak about these things. Well, as you know, Holly, uh, my wife, uh, wrote uh, kind of the the prepper's Bible, 632 pages, 8 and a half, 11, called the Dare to Prepare book. And there are a lot of things in there, very detailed things that are very practical information for people to uh, read about and see whether it applies to their situation or not. Um, in that 632 pages, she's got about 69 chapters. Um, and, and these chapters, each one of them, you know, they deal with like solar cooking or communications or how you prepare for financial meltdown. Now, these things vary with the situation of the individual, but she gives you the, the scenarios that you can choose from. I think probably the most pressing thing at the moment is going to be the economy and loss of jobs, uh, the devaluing of the U.S. dollar, the collapse of the global economy based on the U.S. dollar, perhaps an alien presence toward the end of all this, at the end of this year, early next year, uh, to solve the problems and appoint their man in charge of the planet. By the way, that reminds me, you know that Cache Foundation that Papa Bear was talking about? Mm -hmm. During the break, I was looking at his uh, website uh, during the break, and uh, this guy uh, has set up on his website a, a, like a number of PDFs going for a world peace treaty. And on his site, he says, I'll, I'll quote this, the date of, of uh, January 21st, 2013 for release of these documents is chosen for its importance, and now mankind has 60 days until the 21st of March, 2013, just seven days away, to set the scene to achieve what his forefathers could not do for thousands of years by signing himself into, a, a, yeah, by signing himself into accepting peace in its true sense individually and collectively. Now, how they've set a date, why they've set a date, I don't know. They're in Belgium at the moment and moving out of Belgium to a new location. But his whole thing is about World Peace Treaty, and, you know, this is a time for a peace treaty, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. What do you think he was sent out here? <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's, you know, it's the kind of technology and stuff that certainly would be interesting to people, and he could be a mouthpiece for, you know, the, the announcement of the presence, you know, of, of the aliens, quote-unquote. Well, anyway, I do that's find it possible. interesting. I was going to say I do find it interesting when um, people come out with that kind of um, information, and you know they're not fearing for their lives. I mean, they're not uh, you know usually coming out with something like that. I mean, I don't know uh, how you feel about the old Fred Bell uh, death, but I found that kind of suspicious, and there's been plenty like it. Um, I so I would think uh, the old Fred what, Bell. Attack? Fred Bell, uh, his death, um, I uh, found that kind of suspicious. Uh, Fred Bell was, uh, he was on Jesse Ventura's conspiracy theory. Oh, yes, and, yes, yes, right. And he had a heart attack um, right yeah, after he talked that one. about death. Yeah. So, uh, you know, with, with all that, I say when people come out with this kind of information, um, you know, usually they're not around long. <laughs> no, they're not. But now this guy's not been around long as far as that. I mean, they've had their organization in Belgium for about a year or so, or uh, I think what they've said here. But apparently Belgium is now uh, asking him to leave, you know, put pressure on him to get out of the country. So not, not wiping him out, but telling him to leave. Now, maybe the Belgian government knows a bit more than we do about it. So, you know, I, I can only tell you that they, they don't, they're not comfortable with him being in Belgium. No. Okay. Well, uh, one more thing I wanted to get into uh, with you, Stan, and that's uh, the paradigm change uh, that we can expect. Uh, what, what should we expect here uh, coming up? I mean, you you probably feel like we're in them last days uh, talked about in Revelations. Well, gosh, paradigm change. <laughs> Again, that's <laughs> kind of relative to the individual, but I'd say that as a collective race here, we're about to enter into 
a period of time unlike any other we've experienced on the planet. It's a time of change, some for good, some for bad, and it's going to be catastrophic change. It's going to be very trying times for the next seven to ten years. Um, and so people are going to have to kind of get used to things changing, like how much fresh water they've got, how much energy they can use, what kind of food they've got, if any, uh, if they can get work, will the, the, the money they get be enough to uh, survive and pay the, the bills and eat? Uh, are they going to be at risk of nuclear war? There will be some conflicts like that and terrorist attacks here in this country. There are just a number of things that will change the paradigm in a bad way. I think we're going to see a breakout of civil disobedience on so many fronts, I don't know what to call it, just a civil war. It's going to be civil disobedience. You know, Muslim against Christian, Christian against Muslim, uh, Hispanics against uh, Anglos, uh, whites against uh, blacks. Uh, you know, it, it, there are going to be so many fronts and facets to the civil disobedience when it happens that it's just going to be chaos here in the United States, and I think that day is fast approaching. I agree. I agree. I think so too. And uh, you know, and of course, uh, the the mainstream media and the New World Order—they love to divide people uh, with religion and race and things, and, and put us against each other. And uh, you know, I've been telling people too, being in the cities, uh, in very populated cities, might not be the best place uh, to be uh, in the near future. I don't know. I had somebody. Uh, come on the program and uh, speak about Agenda 21 with me, and uh, she swore up and down that she knew for a fact that they were starting a lot of these fires in the uh, forest areas to draw people into the cities to, you know, get them out of the outsk outskirts uh, as part of their plan to have people, you know, easily uh, rounded up in one area. You know, I don't know. Holly's been uh, Holly's been researching uh, something here um, for gosh several weeks now. Then on the change in population density in the United States, just the United States where we get the stats for it, right? And mm -hmm. she has found that about I think it's one third of the counties of the United States are are in danger of shutting down because of the migration of the people into the cities. And I looked at her map oh, yeah. she had there. And, uh, and, the, and the map shows people are coming out, in the last two years, are coming out of the country areas into the cities in great numbers. That's Agenda 21 right there. That yeah, was Agenda 21. Wow. <laughs> I'll tell you, there's a lot happening, Stan. It, it is so hard to keep up with everything that's going on. Uh, I mean, this is the most active time I can remember in my life. And, you know, I'm only 41, but uh, wow. I mean, I've never seen so much stuff going on at one time. Um, so we're oh, definitely in for one hell of a ride. <laughs> it is. It is that. Um, and I'm sorry so many of our young people are so distracted with technology and gadgets and life and fun that they, they miss reading and understanding what's happening to them. Uh, it's almost like that movie V where the young people are very tempted to, to follow the aliens, because it's a new, wonderful thing, and the old fuddy duddies here saying, look out, are wrong. But they're not. They're not. Have you, have you watched the, the V series, the movies from the 70s? Yes, I did. I said, yes, I did. I remember them well. <laughs> you know, I've tried for years to contact the author of that. That's Ken Johnson. Um, there's another book in the series, the fourth, which they haven't made a movie of yet, but in his as well. When the aliens have taken over the earth, and uh, some good, some bad, and they're starting toward the bad side again, the, there's another race of aliens with more power and uh, supporting mankind to come and depose that. And what have I been talking to you about here today about, you know, Satan being the false messiah and his race or his group of people being, you know, false aliens? And there's one greater who comes who is the righteous one with his power and his uh, troops. And that's the second "quote unquote" alien race because they don't live around here, coming to rid us of the first kind that's been plaguing mankind. So Ken Johnson has worked so much of biblical prophecy and history into his work, a uh, secular work, that I am just amazed. I mean, even the blood of a hybrid uh, human alien baby is used to defeat the aliens or to keep them off of certain areas. 
you know, this blood powder residue, and it's like the, the, the blood of Christ saves men, mankind, you know, saves you from your eternal death. And the, that similarity is in Johnson's work. It's just, I, I just, my jaw dropped every time I started realizing that, that here's another central thing that, that uh, Johnson talked about in his theme. Yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, I was just telling the listeners last night, uh, a friend of mine, Peter Kling, had shared a uh, movie trailer with me. It's called uh, World War Z. Um, and I checked out this movie trailer, this uh, movie that's supposed to be coming out, uh, I don't know when, any day now, I guess. And if it doesn't showcase what it's going to look like in the very near future, I don't know what does. I mean, there was people, it looked like ants running up mountains. It was just total chaos um, all over the world. And, and here in the United States, it's just all hell broke loose. And uh, I suggest if anybody's curious of what it might look like, go check out that uh, trailer for World War Z, it's called. World War Z, um, is it? Yeah, well, World we War Z. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, in Hollywood, they, they love to uh, showcase the future, it seems. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if that's the future, that's pretty scary um, because uh, scary. it really, yeah, it certainly is. Well, Stan, well, if there's anything that you'd like to get out there that uh, we haven't discussed, uh, anything uh, you want to plug or what have you, by all means, please go ahead. You know, Michael, there's so much there that I I, I don't know where to begin. Um, I'm hoping that uh, people will look at two very important survival books, one that Holly's got called Dare to Prepare, which basically tells you how to prepare physically as best you can for a lot of the events that could potentially happen and probably will happen, most of them, in some form or another. And then the spiritual preparation, which I wrote in The Cosmic Conspiracy. And my book started in 1978, first edition, and that's uh, now 300 pages. It was 200 pages, and I last updated in 2010 with the last warning explaining about this great deception about to happen and not to be fooled. So between that book, Holly's book and my book, there's the spectrum of preparation. One says, you know, my book says spiritually, you are going to die sometime. You may die before you thought you would and what's coming. So it's important to get your relationship with your life hereafter, you know, straight with God. And that's what the, the book tells you that in scientific terms what's happening in the history of it and where we're headed. And then there's uh, a page in there where you can sign your name and say, okay, I accept salvation through Jesus Christ. That's important. That's the first thing you do. Then you prepare to endure until he comes to collect you if he's going to you know, take you out of here like he did with Noah you know, into a place of safety while the judgments hit. And the practical preparation Holly has in that book, we have done it ourselves. There's, there's virtually nothing in there that we haven't tested or had friends test to be sure that it would work and what, how it would work and, you know, how necessary it was. So between the two, that's the importance of prep, uh, preparation. And if you just go to the standao.com website, there's even a whole website full of free stuff to download to help you start preparing immediately. In addition, you can get the books, and that is the thing that you take with you when there's no Internet. There's just so much information there that you, you have to have it in printed form. It, it's not safe to carry it on digital stuff. It could be corrupted by EMPs and things like that. Now, Holly gets up six days a week, as I said, at the beginning of the program, about 4.30 in the morning, sometimes earlier, when she's got you know uh, news on the mind. And she prepares our website with links to the important news stories, you know, geophysics, political, uh, religious, that kind of stuff, to... And she, she groups it so that you can have a quick read, you know, the headlines, and, okay, I want to read that. You click a button, you go to it. But it helps people, saves them time. Early in the morning they get up and they look at this. We watch them come in on our, our web stats. And they'll read it before they go to work. They'll read it at lunchtime, and they'll read it in the evening when they get home. Seeing what's going on around them, it keeps them in the loop as long as we can have Internet access. So it's very important to, that people follow that up go to our website. Absolutely, and that's key, too, uh, you know, as long as we have the Internet. <laughs> it is. I mean, that's, <laughs> we're, I don't know how many days, weeks, or months we've got left in that between the Chinese trying to take our, our system down and, and Obama trying to make a new Internet under total control of the government and shutting it. 
And, uh, you know, with people wanting to know, because, I mean, you know, with uh, EMP stuff, I mean, we're just, uh, I don't know how long the Internet will be there. We expect at any moment for it to just disappear, at least for the private citizen. Anyway. Yeah, well, I hope that uh, I hope that doesn't happen. But uh, they've, they've certainly been trying to uh, get control of the Internet for quite a while now. And, uh, you know, all it'll take is one false flag or, or another, and uh, that's what will happen. Wake up one day and you'll be stuck with just the, the fake news if you're lucky. If you're lucky, yeah, and martial law on top of that. Yeah, <laughs> that's something to think about, Stan. That's for sure. Um, you know, all I can say is people need to be prepared, and um, I suggest that they strong. I strongly suggest they follow the information on your website. Uh, I certainly do. I have a friend, uh, John Moore, um, who I know that he, on a regular basis, uh, gets checks out information from your website, and uh, you both do a fantastic job. And I want to thank you so much, Stan. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to your audience there, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, we're, we're certainly doing our bit to help, folks. Uh, Holly and I don't take vacations. It would certainly be nice if we could, but there's just no time. Uh, every day is just jam-packed. I think we spend between 90 and 100 hours a week doing some kind of work here on this, and it's got to be done. We're hoping enough people survive that, uh, you know, we'll all get together and rebuild what's left. Yeah, I hope you're right, Stan, and, uh, you know, uh, God bless you, my friend, and thank you so much for being a guest tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Bye-bye now. All right.